All right, I am going to go ahead and get started with the presentation. Um, I'll introduce myself first. Hey, everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Shanna Schultz. I am the Council Planning Manager for the Albuquerque City Councilor. I am a staff member um, who assists all nine of the councilors with planning related legislation. Um, today, I will be giving you a presentation on some of the amendments to the Integrated Development Ordinance, um, or as I will call it moving forward, the IDO. The IDO is the city's kind of land use regulatory tool. Uh, it's our zoning code that outlines what someone can and cannot do on a private property. Um, and every year we go through an update process to make sure that this document is kind of up to date, responding to trends, um, is, is kept clean. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to fix any errors, but also propose kind of new substantive ideas to make sure that our regulatory framework is being responsive to the world as it changes. Um, so today what I'm going to go through is about a 15 minute presentation about the amendments that will be proposed at the May 2nd City Council meeting. Um, that's less than a week from today, the nine city councilors, this is a, you know, a regularly scheduled city council meeting um, at which they will be considering amendments to the IDO. After that presentation, which I hope to keep brief, uh, we'll do a Q&A session. Um, I'm hoping that participants will kind of use the raise their hand function in Zoom and we'll call on individual speakers to do some Q&A and answer some questions that you might have about any of these updates. With that, I am going to just jump right into it. So to start the presentation, I'm going to discuss two amendments that already passed at the subcommittee level. So the IDO has already been considered by the Council's Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee at a total of three meetings uh, between March and April, at which point they adopted, mm, you know, 12 to 15 amendments to the IDO. There are two amendments uh, that that committee passed that do have implications for what's in the packet on Monday, and so I want to briefly discuss those to kind of lay some framework for those amendments next week. The first one uh, is safe outdoor spaces. This was again passed by the LUPS committee. It's labeled amendment A12, um, and it looks like Michaela is posting some links in the chat if you want to see those LUPS amendments as the committee passed them. If you wanted to pull up amendment A12, uh, feel free to click on those links that she's posting there. Um, Okay, so safe outdoor spaces. This created a new land use in the IDO called a safe outdoor space. The very first thing it did was it outlined which zones in which a safe outdoor space could occur. Um, and I've kind of got those listed here in my bullet points under conditional and permissive. Uh, a conditional use and a permissive use are two very different things. Um, if something is listed as a conditional use, you have to go for what I would call kind of extra permission through the zoning hearing examiner of the city. So while a use is permissive, as long as you meet the requirements in the IDO and the DPM, you can just do it. Um, when something is a conditional use, there is kind of an extra um, layer of public hearing involved and um, justification of the project involved. So the a safe outdoor space is proposed to be conditional in the MXT, that's mixed use transition zone, MXL, that's mixed use light intensity, MXM, mixed use medium intensity, and MXH, mixed use high intensity zones. It would be permissive in all of what we call the NR zones. Uh, that's non-residential. We've got NRC, non-residential commercial. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, NRBP, non-residential business park. NRLM, non-residential light manufacturing. And NRGM, non-residential general manufacturing. Um, safe outdoor spaces would be prohibited adjacent to major public open space. Those are mapped areas in our system. So if we know that a parcel is directly next to major public open space, you would not be able to do a safe outdoor space. Um, there is a city council district cap of five. So no single council district could have more than five safe outdoor spaces. There's a 330 foot distance separation between a safe outdoor space and the RA zone, R1 zone, RMC zone, or RT zone with low density residential development. Those R dash zones are typically where our low density single family residential neighborhoods are housed. The R1 zone is definitely the most prominent zone in the city of Albuquerque. So there would be a a distance separation of 330 feet, which is typically thought of as your kind of average city block um, between a safe outdoor space and those areas. 
there is a 660 foot distance separation, so about two city blocks between any safe outdoor space that has more than 10 designated spaces and 15 occupants. Um, so if the, if the safe outdoor space is kind of smaller in nature, the distance separation wouldn't apply, but once you get to 10 designated spaces and 15 occupants um, and you're near another safe outdoor space, that would have 10 designated spaces, at least 10 designated spaces and at least 15 occupants, then you've got a two block distance separation requirement. Um, every safe outdoor space has a maximum of 40 designated spaces and designated spaces are what we would think of, um, of where someone might set up a tent, where someone might park their car or their recreational vehicle, kind of you know, their delineated space for them to exist. Um, each safe outdoor space would have a maximum of 40 of those and a max of 50 people. There's requirements for hand washing stations, toilets, and showers with any kind of safe outdoor space. And there's more nuanced requirements for those in the amendment. I would encourage you to read Amendment A12 as it passed by the LUPS committee. Um, and if a safe outdoor space is only housing folks in tents, there would be a requirement for a six foot opaque wall, fence, or vegetative screen around that area where those folks um, have their tents. Every safe outdoor space would require a management plan or a security agreement. And those plans that they submit to the city would have to indicate on-site support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So someone would have to be on-site to kind of be responsive to the needs of the community staying there. Um, and then there's also a requirement that social services be offered. And that, that is also outlined in the individual amendment itself. So that amendment was uh, passed by the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee on April 13th. Again, I'm laying the groundwork on this amendment because that you will find amendments that I will discuss later have implications for this. The other amendment that the land use, <clears throat> excuse me, planning and zoning committee passed at their April 13th hearing related to non-residential conversions to residential uses. Um, the committee passed an amendment that would allow for a simpler kitchen to be provided if an applicant wanted to convert uh, what we would call a non-residential use, so a property or a building that currently houses non-residential activities, uh, to a residential use, um, specifically a multifamily use, when the project is associated with city funding through the Department of Family and Community Services. Uh, when the Department of Family and Community Services is providing funding for multifamily projects, that would be considered an affordable housing project. So this is about non-residential conversions to residential uses for affordable housing. Um, this would require that a separate bathroom and kitchen are still, still required in every unit, but the main distinction being that um, a countertop appliance could meet the definition of a kitchen. Today in the IDO, if you're wanting to develop um, multifamily housing, you have to provide a full range stove or oven uh, this option, again, when the project is an affordable housing uh, complex supported with city funding, that that, that requirement for a full kitchen um, is lessened with the, the allowance of a countertop appliance to meet that particular requirement. Um, a refrigerator with a separate freezer compartment would have to be provided that way folks could, you know, store um, temperature sensitive food. And all of these complexes would require that 40 hours of support services a week be provided to residents. Um, the LEPS committee also put some occupancy limits on each unit. Those are listed on the bullet points below. Um, I think the idea behind that amendment was just to make sure that the units weren't getting so <clears throat> inundated with large groups of people um, since we're acknowledging that the, the kitchen provisions are a little lesser than would normally be. So th those are the only two amendments that I'm gonna cover that passed the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee. The rest of the amendments that I'm about to review, and there are 13 of them, uh, will be up for consideration by the City Council on May 2nd uh, at the regularly scheduled 5 p.m. meeting. The first one is related to cannabis uses in the Old Town area. As a part of this year's IDO annual update, there's a proposal that all cannabis uses, and there are three of them that the IDO contemplates, there's cannabis retail, where you would sell cannabis products, cannabis um, cultivation, where you would grow cannabis, and cannabis manufacturing, where you would take that grown product and create it into something that would later be sold at a retail location. Uh, this year's IDO annual update proposes to completely prohibit all three of those things in the Old Town area. 
um, in the boundary that is known as the Historic Protection Overlay Zone 5. That's the Old Town HPO 5. This amendment proposes to, instead of saying it would be a full-on prohibition, that cannabis retail could occur in the Old Town HPO 5 area, but only when it's associated with a micro-business license. A micro-business license is something that the state offers folks looking to get into the cannabis industry as a um, kind of smaller, more nuanced version of the general license. Um, and there are requirements on how much product you can grow, own, or sell. Um, and the, that, that type of license, specifically micro-business, would be allowed in Old Town if Amendment B1 is to pass um, through the council. Amendment B2, and you know, I, I will back up and say that all of these amendments can be, you can find the full text of them on the abc-zone.com website. Again, I believe Michaela was posting uh, links to that website in the chat. If you'd like to view the whole packet and see the exact language of any of these amendments, that would be the place to do that. Um, and I would also say keep an eye out on that abc-zone.com website. Anytime there are updated amendments or new packets of amendments, that is the first place that they get posted. Um, thanks, Michaela. I see she just popped a, an, a link in there now. So amendment B2, if you're following along in that packet that Michaela just linked, is titled Living Lots. This would create a new land use called living lots for occupancy of tents, light vehicles, and recreational vehicles. Um, there would be some requirements for hand washing stations and toilets, and the amendment goes on to outline where these can be, where these can occur, and that would be permissive in all of the mixed use zones. Uh, those are some of the zones we talked about earlier, MXT all the way up through MXH and also permissive through all of the non-residential zones, again, those NR-zones that we discussed earlier. The next several amendments, any of these titled Safe Outdoor Spaces, seek to change what the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee already approved at their April 13th meeting. Um, as the IDO annual update continues its way through the review and adoption process through the city council. Councilors, you know, can always propose amendments to do something new that the land use planning and zoning committee didn't already consider, or if they want to go in a different direction than something the land use planning and zoning committee approved or disapproved, they are welcome to propose a new amendment at the full city council level, uh, which is what the packet of amendments before us today aims to do. So these next, I think it's five, maybe six, um, that are labeled safe outdoor spaces seek to change that amendment A12 that I described at the very start of this meeting. So this first one, um, I think is pretty cut and dry. Uh, B3 proposes to rescind amendment A12 in its entirety as it was passed by the LUPS committee. Um, so if, if this amendment were to, to pass that safe outdoor space um, that I had described, here, this would all just go away. It would just be deleted um, as it was passed by that committee and there would be no new land use called safe outdoor space in the IDO. <clears throat> amendment B4 seeks to make some cleanup language um, to amendment A12 as it was passed. Uh, there's, there's kind of four topics covered in amendment B4. Um, the first one being that the city council district cap that was added later in the LUPS process, um, we would be exempting that for religious institutions. There is federal law called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Um, we call it RELUPA for short, so we don't have to say that mouthful every time. Um, really limits how municipalities can go on to limit religious institutions um, land use entitlements. And so to make sure that, you know, the changes that were made to safe outdoor spaces in terms of the city council district cap is continues to be compliant with what our LUPA sets forth, um, we would need to exempt religious institutions, which is part of what this amendment aims to do. Um, it also proposes a very minor cleanup. The safe outdoor spaces amendment, as it was passed by the committee, uses the term campsite. Um, that is not a term in safe outdoor spaces. The, that, that, that use safe outdoor space almost always uses the term designated space as opposed to campsite. It was kind of a technical error on staff's part to, to write campsite instead of designated space. So that's a, a pretty simple cleanup. 
Um, a clarification that any required showers may become or may be portable in perpetuity. Uh, Amendment A12 outlines that <clears throat> sinks and toilets after two years of operations have to become permanently plumbed. That's a way of saying that you, you might be able to get away with porta potties for the first couple of years while the safe outdoor space is getting up and running. But after those two years, um, that those need to be kind of permanent fixtures. This clarifies that this, that is not the case for showers, that portable showers would be able to meet um, the requirements in perpetuity. Um, and then the last clarification is that when the fencing is required for tented areas, that that fenced area has to be secured such as with a lock or something similar. Okay, Amendment B5, still on the topic of safe outdoor spaces, seeks to reduce the capacity as outlined in the original amendments. Um, <clears throat> in my very first slide, if you'll recall, I outlined that there was a capacity of 40 designated spaces uh, with a maximum occupancy of 50 people. This amendment would drop that down to a maximum number of 30 designated spaces with a potential maximum of 40 people. Amendment B6 aims to make some changes about the security requirements for the site. Um, today, as the amendment was passed by the committee, it says that on-site um, support shall be provided. This would also add a requirement to say that on-call on call security, so not necessarily on-site, but on-call security must also be provided on a 24 hours a day, seven days a week basis. Amendment B7 aims to change the zoning districts in which a safe outdoor space can occur. Again, calling back to my first slide, if you'll recall, I had said that the, in the MXM and MXH zone, that a safe outdoor space would be conditional. Um, this amendment proposes to change that conditional designation to permissive. Uh, meaning that there would be no conditional use process required, um, no process through the zoning hearing examiner, it would just be permissive. It also adds a new prohibition that no safe outdoor space could occur in the downtown center, which is a mapped area in the IDO, main street corridors, which again is a mapped area in the IDO, or urban centers, um, of which the city only has a couple right now. There's Uptown is an example of an urban center, and so is the undeveloped urban, I'm sorry, Volcano Heights area in the northwest part of town. Safe outdoor spaces would not be able to occur in those areas at all. Um, okay, Amendment B8, and I'm sorry, I forgot half the title for this one. This is, this is still about safe outdoor spaces. Um, but is about the city council district cap requirements. Today, uh, the safe outdoor space amendment says that you can't have more than five per city council district. Amendment B8 seeks to do two things. First, it will reduce that cap from five to two, and it will combine it with the other use that I spoke about at the beginning, that um, conversion of non-residential projects to uh, multifamily housing when the project is associated with city funding. Um, so this, this amendment would say that you could only have two of either of those. So you might have one safe outdoor space and one conversion of a non-residential -res project, and that gets you to a total of two, which means that you may not have any more of either of those. Amendment B9 is related to pre-application review team meetings. Um, which I will call PRT meetings for short. PRT meetings are something that is mandatory in the IDO today for a lot of application types. This is a kind of non-binding conversational type of meeting that an applicant is required to have with the city um, to kind of tell the city what they're thinking about doing so that the city can provide some guidance about what the review and decision process is gonna be, which which uh, sections in the IDO they need to keep an eye out for that they will have to comply with. Um, it's a meeting that's intended to kind of help the applicant understand what requirements they will be required to meet um, as a part of the IDO process. Um, prior to the IDO, PRTs were not a requirement for most applications, so this amendment seeks to not make them required but still make them available 
to applicants who might still want to come have that non-binding, very preliminary conversation with the city. There are a couple of applications, however, where PRTs would still be required in perpetuity, and I've, I've listed those here. Uh, they're mostly actions related to subdividing property or actions related um, to development in established historic areas in the city. Those actions would still require PRT meetings, but all other application types in the IDO would be, <clears throat> excuse me, would be voluntary. Amendment B10 proposes to add some requirements for when the city um, proposes text amendment changes to the IDO as a part of the IDO annual update process. What this amendment does is it says for each individual text amendment change, um, the city needs to outline a couple things for the public. Uh, that way folks might have a better understanding of what that amendment is trying to do. Uh, the, first, the first two I think are, are relatively technical in nature. It says that you know the page of the IDO that's being amended needs to be provided. That way someone could refer to the entire document um, to kind of get some context of the section that's being changed. The section number of heading and heading of the IDO would also need to be provided, again, to provide some context about what um, section or chapter of the IDO that amendment is proposing to, to amend. And then lastly, a kind of summary statement or paragraph to explain the intent of the text amendment, the origin, kind of where the idea came from for that text amendment, and the need for that amendment, the, the kind of questions about, well, what will happen if we don't pass this amendment? Um, hopefully those kind of, you know, four or five requirements will um, help, help folks better understand what each individual text amendment is aiming to do and why. Um, amendment B11 proposes to revise some of the cannabis provisions on a citywide scale. So when we talked about Amendment B1 earlier, we were talking specifically about cannabis provisions in the Old Town HPO5 area. Uh, Amendment B11 is much more broad than that. It, it covers um, cannabis uses citywide. Um, what it would require is that if on-site consumption areas, which is something the state uh, does authorize folks to do, if there's on-site consumption areas, that those have to be conducted fully indoors within a fully enclosed building. Um, that way we don't end up having like, you know, cannabis smoking patios, for example. Uh, it would limit the retail size of cannabis retail in the MXM, that's the Mixed Use Medium Zone District, to 10,000 square feet. Um, this uh, provision is intended to be aligned with other retail uses in the IDO, which are also limited to 10,000 square feet. Uh, when the cannabis provisions were adopted into the IDO last year, uh, cannabis retail, you know, should have been limited to 10,000 square feet to better track with general retail. That was a little bit of an oversight, and so this proposes proposes to add that limitation in. And lastly, it would require that cannabis cultivation and cannabis derived products manufacturing, that's the two other cannabis related uses in the IDO, that when they come in for approval before the city, that they have to provide a letter of availability from the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority. B12 uh, proposes to amend the definition of major public open space. Uh, this is a definition that exists in section seven of the IDO, um, and the changes to this will kind of better define how the IDO considers major public open space. Namely, um, if a piece of property in the city is going to be formally considered major public open space, it has to have one of the open space zones associated with it. Um, one, I think, lovely thing with the IDO adoption is that all of our parks and open space got their own zoning districts, uh, which they didn't have prior to the IDO. That's the NR-PO-B, that's non-residential, parks and open space, and then that B designation indicates that it's major public open space. Um, that parcels that are considered major public open space have to be zoned properly. They have to have that NRPOB zoning district. Um, and very similarly with the NRPOC district, uh, another type of open space zone that the IDO has, uh, that those zoning des designations need to be in place before major public open space protections will apply. 
Uh, and lastly uh, is Amendment B13, which is accompanied in the packet by an exhibit. Uh, so you'll want to take a look at that full exhibit to understand the full scope of the changes here. Uh, but Amendment B13 proposes to replace the Development Review Board um, with an individual called the Development Hearing Officer. This Development Hearing Officer, or DHO, will be a third party kind of independent reviewer uh, from the city. If you think about and are familiar with the zoning hearing examiner process in the IDO today, that zoning hearing examiner or that ZHE is an independent person who is on contract to the city to hear various decisions as outlined in the IDO. Um, the development review board does not operate in, in that kind of similar manner and that the DRB, the development review board, um, is really comprised of city, is only comprised of city staff members today. So those city staff members are, are kind of in a tricky place having to wear what we would maybe you know, refer to as multiple hats. They are both the staff members of the city who review and kind of analyze a request, but then they're also the decision maker on that request. And when you think about a body like the ZHE or the Environmental Planning Commission, for example, or even the city council, those are all kind of independent bodies who are not city staff members. Um, and for kind of the integrity of the development review process, it's, it seems important that that person who is reviewing very technical matters such as subdivision requests really, really should be a, an independent third party person. So this, um, this amendment proposes to kind of rework that DRB system and will kind of transfer any decisions that were made by the DRB today uh, to either this new DHO individual, this development hearing officer. Um, some decisions will be reviewed administratively, but the bulk of them will go before the DHO who will still be, who will still uh, conduct public hearings, take public testimony, uh, swear people in, um, do all the do all the same things that the DRB does today, but it'll it'll really be the responsibility of a kind of independent individual. And that is that is the end of what I would characterize the whirlwind of a presentation for the thirteen amendments that the city council will be considering on Monday. Um, if you want to attend this city council meeting to provide comment or even just to listen in, uh, there's kind of, there's two opportunities to do that. The council is taking public comments in person again, so you're welcome to come down to the chamber starting at 5 p.m. Um, or you may also provide public comments um, remotely via Zoom. For either of those options, you do have to sign up prior to 4 p.m. Um, on May 2nd. So that's the day of the meeting on Monday. The instructions for how to do that will be published this Friday with the city council agenda. There will be a link for a sign up sheet and you can go there uh, to sign up for public comments either in person or virtually. I've also left a link here to the www.abc-zone.com website. I know Michaela has been dropping links in the chat, but if you wanted to, to kind of note that, um, again, that is the best resource to view any of these amendments um, and any changed amendments as they might get published as the week goes on and certainly leading up to the city council meeting.